Hi everyone, my name is Jennifer Hancock and I welcome you to the Humanistic Professionals Lunch and Learn. This is a project of the International Humanistic Management Association, which is a collection of people who are committed to the promotion of humanistic management. And one of the things we like to do is amplify the work of other people. Um, and that's what this is for. But we also, um, if you have work you think we should know about, we have a submission form on our website, which is humanisticmanagement.international. And you can look for the submission form and tell us about what you're working on. And we can maybe put it up on our well website. We're also always interested <laughs> in having volunteers. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff we could be doing if we had more people. Uh, myself, I am Jennifer Hancock. I am a board member for the USA chapter of the, the Management Association. I'm also the founder of Humanist Learning Systems. I'm the education partner for this series. Um, this program is certified, pre-certified by HRCI and SHRM for continuing education credits, and you can also get a general certificate of participation if you like. My co-host is Elizabeth. Elizabeth, please introduce yourself. Hi everyone, I am Elizabeth Castillo. I'm an assistant professor of organizational leadership at Arizona State University. Thank you. And our guest today is Manuel Guillen. He is an associate professor of management and business ethics at the University of Valencia in Spain. He is the founder and director of the Institute for Ethics and Communication in Organizations. And he holds the chair of business ethics, IECOUV. Manuel is a regular visiting scholar at the IGLP at Harvard Law School and is the University of Valencia representative at RCC Harvard University. Manuel, welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Elizabeth. And thank you uh, to the Humanistic Management Association for giving me this opportunity to share ideas. And during the next 10 minutes, I will just use 10 minutes. I want to basically share ideas. And certain ideas in this case is really for telling you about my story. And my story is about a professor who started teaching human motivations. And, and he realized that what he was teaching for more than 10 years was wrong, in the sense that it was too limited. Uh, I, I had the feeling that it was not fair to tell to my students something that I really believe it was right. So that took me to 10 years of research with my students and also with my colleagues. And what I did, and I'm going to share with you now is basically to develop a framework that is, is very simple and very complex. And I guess this is exactly what human being is. We are very simple and really complex. So I will try to explain this really quick in, and just with an example. And later I can go to any of the details of the description that you want, but then I will go to the practical or the practicality of this. The idea is that I, I had a dialogue between Trevor and Maslow, very well-known uh, psychologist studying uh, motivation. And if you ask me why am I here today, which are my motivations, or why are you here today listening to this guy here in Spain, Valencia, we can answer that question by going to the dialogue between Maslow and Herbert. Herbert would say, well, they're extrinsic motive. And extrinsic motive means that I'm here because my university is paying me a lot to be a professor. So that's support, that's a lower level motivation by Maslow and extrinsic. I receive a good from outside and I, I want it, I need it. It's the good that I look for, uh, I receive it. And then also there is an upper level of that extrinsic understanding, which is I will receive also something that is pleasant, it's nice and it's related to people. So being here tonight or today is really nice because I'm having your, your relationship with you and also a support from my institution then it's not only about extrinsic, we also are moved, moved, motivated by intrinsic motivation, which means when I'm speaking right now, I'm also improving the way I teach and using, learning to use this technology, I'm getting mastery, which is intrinsic. While doing the action, you get a good, in this case, practical, useful good. But also, I'm having a lot of fun. I love teaching. So intrinsic motivation is about learning, mastery, and satisfaction. I wish you all today in the next 10 minutes or during the hour, you're getting at least learning something new, enjoying, having fun, and also getting a connection with other people and maybe some support out of the credits of the course. So we cover what mainly we explain in every business school. My concern teaching to my students is that this is what we teach. And we stop here when we describe the model of motivation. 
And I, I kept telling them, we are missing something. What about morality? What about ethics? We are human. What about freedom? It's not there. This can be applied to any animal, even a non-free non animal. So how do you solve that? Well, I had a conversation then with a guy who is called Aristotle. And this guy is really smart. And he said, well, you know what? There's not just useful good and pleasant good, as you can see here. There's also a kind of good that is moral. And the moral good is different from the useful because the useful is not even a real good. If you look it for the sake of something else, it's practical. But the useful good, we all need it. But the pleasant one, we look for its own sake. The moral one, we also look for its own sake. And it's about human personal growth and flourishing, becoming a better person. This is humanistic one as well. So we move here and we can then find that there is an extrinsic reason why we do things and we go to work and why I'm here to get respect. We want people to tell us the truth, to be fair with us, to respect us. That's what exactly what we are expecting. And it's fitting perfectly with the extrinsic understanding of her. When you are not respected, then you feel really bad and then you will react wrong. And then the other thing is intrinsic. While I'm doing the action, I'm not only learning, mastering, and then having satisfaction, enjoying, but also becoming a better person, getting virtues, moral virtues. In fact, why am I here today? Not only because I will get respect, but also because I think this is the right thing to do. And then you do things because they are the right thing to do. This is good. And you practice the good because it's good, and not because it's useful or nice. Sometimes it's not nice. You, I may not feel well today, and by the way, I may not even get money from this. But I'm still here, which means all the motivation are mixed, and sometimes one is having more uh, kind of wealth there than the others. Then there is an assumption in the motivation we were teaching to our students before, and I was teaching before, that is we are immoral, but we are moral. But there is also a second assumption we are making in this presentation, which is we are egoist, egoist, egoist. We just are self-interested, because if you look at this, it's only receiving good and acquiring, attaining good. What about giving? What about transcendent motives, transitive motives? We all also go to work to do service, some useful good, some pleasant good, and some moral good, which is benevolence. And we forget about that, but it's common sense. In fact, if what I'm teaching today, I don't think is useful or true or good, I wouldn't be just here. So this is common sense, but we don't explain that. Now there are a lot of researchers getting to this point, like Adam Grant talking about givers, takers, and matchers, for example, which is fitting perfectly with this framework. And that said, well, I presented this in Harvard years ago, and you know what happened? And a student from Spain came to me doing the MB program and said, I love it. You know what? I didn't hear about this framework before, but I'm missing something. And he said, what about the spiritual dimension? And I said, well, you know what? You're right. You're right. So I spent a year thinking about it. And with the help of my colleagues, Professor Ferrero and Hoffman in Boston, uh, I got to find that Maslow wrote a book that is posthumous. And the title of the book is The Farther Reaches of Human Nature, in which he's explicitly saying that to be happy. And motivation, human motivation, has to do also with meta motivation that includes spiritual aspects and religious aspects. So we built that framework, and here is the framework. The good news also is that this is fitting with the majority of good psychology explanation of human happiness and growth. Why? Because we all need to be loved, to receive good, which is be loved. We need to love ourselves, self-esteem and love properly ourselves, also to love others. And for those who have faith in one God, then to love God, which is receiving good, attaining good, giving good, and then giving back the good we receive or the talents. So this is a framework that now I have this, this feeling when I'm teaching this and using this in, in business, that is a map that is including every aspect of human nature, as Maslow was saying in his latest book. Um, by the way, no one has read that book, so I would imagine to read maybe all of you, but most people don't even know what the book is. That was a discovery for me. So now to finish with the 10 minutes that I have, I have two more minutes. I was saying, and so what? Well, first thing, are we creating humane work environments? Meaning, are we considering all these motivations in our incentive systems, in the way we manage people? And I'm thinking about my students, but also people working in my institute, and I'm the director. 
So am I using, considering all these aspects of human motivation and how? This is one question I would like to discuss during the rest of the discussion. How can we promote better workplaces? Uh, I will just give an answer, because it's answering to many of the questions that you did previously. And how can we promote better work? By the way, the first question, are we creating humane border violence? I think we are not, in many cases. Not always, but in many cases we are not. That's why I consider this to be so relevant. First, to have a good map, road map, and then to put it into practice. How can we promote better workplaces? I would say the, the, the answer for me right now in practice, in business, is asking. Motivation are internal, are always reasons for behavior. So we need to keep asking because this is dynamic and it's changing and it's promoting change. So we need to keep asking all the time. And many times we have a mechanistic approach to motivation, incentive system in which we don't even ask. And the third thing, where are the limits? Well, the limits are in human freedom. Because what I see here is precisely something that I discovered when studying all this and being observed, that we cannot work on motivation if we don't agree on understanding human freedom and respecting human freedom. And this is how you build trust, by taking the risk of other people, freedom. And that means that you can think that your work is just a job, but you may also think it's a career, or it's a calling. And there's a professor at Yale working about this, work as a job, career, and calling. And I couldn't believe that this is fitting perfectly with this framework, perfectly. Did you go to the definition given by this professor? Well, the other thing is that adding a fourth level, which is work as a mission, with a more transcendental and transcendent way of considering yourself as someone created and with a mission to be happy and to make a lot of people happy in this world. But what I mean with this is that you decide if you see your job, your work as a job, as a career, as a calling, or as a mission, it's not the manager. It's each one of the employees making that decision. And this is 10 minutes, which means and answering one of the questions, answering one of the questions, for me, this is my work. I, I, I was committed to do it, and I'm a very committed person. So I put all my study of 10 years in just two slides that we will share with you when we're ready. So one last thing, and I'm still in the, in the 10 minutes before we to 11, is that you just can create the environment for people to decide which one of the motivation they decide to have. If you're in a mechanistic approach the job and the career, you can think of people as animals and machines. And then you would push the button and think people will answer. But this is not respect for freedom. When you move to the moral one, then you will understand the freedom of people and then their understanding of their work as a calling if they want, or as a mission if they want. This is something they have to decide. And what you can do is to create, to develop the environment around yourself in your company to do that. But this is another conversation. Where are the limits? Thank you. Thank you so much, Manuel. Can you leave this up for a little bit? Because I want to ask you some questions related to this slide. Yes. Can when I, we talk, this one. Or this, one? Um, this one. Okay. Um, when we talked the other day, hmm. we talked about, you know, how do how does someone take this back to the workplace? Should they be creating a workplace and kind of requiring employees to work as a mission? Or is the job of the manager to help make sure the foundation is there so that at the minimum an employee can consider it a career, but ideally create the foundation where they might even consider it work as a calling because you can't force people to think about their work in any particular way. But what is the role of a manager in creating a, a framework within the workplace for these other levels of higher motivations to manifest in the workplace? Well, I think you already gave part of the answer, but the, the, the way I say it is that a good manager is the one that first describes very well the job itself in the, in the sense of technical definition of the job and the content and the salary and all that stuff. He's good at that. He's also describing well the career that that person may have in that company if there is that option or not. So you need to go step by step because you're covering lower level needs and motivations which are part of justice, this is fair. And then if you really want to be excellent and having people working from their inner calling, then which is excellence, that means giving to them first with is theirs, which is justice, and then let them give more if they want. But then that step, as you said, 
is something that you can only develop once you have the other two well built, well done, and then mainly through example and building the culture through personal example by also doing things out of a personal calling or mission and transitive motivation. So people will see that and you, they will see that you're doing the project and the company is just about them and about their contribution to society and their own flourishing. Then they will want to flourish by themselves because it's something they have to decide because they, are, they feel respected, they feel they have an environment in which they can flourish and they, they will want to do the same as the boss, giving themselves to others. If they also have faith, they will see this as an opportunity to go to heaven, to say yes to God when asking something from them and all that stuff. So this is all compatible in the same one hour of work. It's just about how do you see your work, the meaning that you give to your own hour of work. Uh, so the work of the manager is very limited, but it's still very important. So what are two or three things a manager or an HR professional can bring back to their company to start laying this foundation of understanding of what is motivating the employees so that they can help the employees flourish within their organization? What are two or three things that they could do? Well, I, I think I've already said that kind of message before because I think the first thing is uh, having more kind of conversations. So it's starting to have more conversation. And as the content of that conversation, they can use this framework. Like basically asking people, they don't, they don't I mean, this depends on the level of trust in each company. So you, there are things you cannot do. I will tell you an example of yesterday. We were talking about, well, I don't, I shouldn't say the company, it's an American company. But that model, that business model is so mechanistic. It's a franchise that is copy and paste everywhere. And they have, they are very good in processes. And they are making a lot of money but they really don't care much about people. They don't pay much attention to the third level. So in that sense, unless in the company, that's part of the mission. That, that's what my MBA students were saying. Unless they change their mission, they cannot help other people to improve in their own mission, calling. So I love that, what they said. So what I'm saying now will depend a lot on what kind of model you have in your business or your company. If in your company, I can tell you, uh, when Enron happened and, and Arthur Anderson was basically receiving money to say things that were wrong and not really not true. I got an offer from UK, Arthur Anderson, to give a training program on the model of leadership following this. And I had to say no, because that company was a so mechanistic, just career and job model, they couldn't move to the other one. What I mean with this is that to give the first practical thing I would say to managers is, is your mission connected with the first level, second, third? Do examination of concepts regarding your mission. Then do examination of concepts regarding your own motivation. Because if you want to move farther than just career, you need to make sure this is also part of yourself. If not, don't even try. It's not working. You're using with a mechanistic perspective something that is humanistic. And humanistic means we are not machines. Neither machines nor animals. So you need to understand those people's behavior, be patient, but start by giving a sample and taking the risk of all these people freedom. So that's the second one. Third would be as content of, of the conversation, you will find out how involved people is. And then I can give you an example of a real company. They're in Boston. They have this kind of training with a professor from Harvard, Donna Hicks, about human dignity. And it's funny because the cleaning staff before they were basically in this kind of aspect, work, work as a job, this is just my job, you know, I have to clean, that's all. But once they understood that because the way they are cleaning is essential in terms of success of the company. I mean, the, 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 if they're not cleaning properly, there will be infections. And infections mean lack of success in the organization. They saw now their job as a development, personal development, but also a calling to do good and the opportunity to contribute even more than the surgeries or the director of the hospital. And they're just members of the cleaning staff. They now see their job as something. So having a conversation in which you really, you really share with your employees what you think is your company about will bring you the opportunity to think about their motivations. But if you are not first taking this seriously, don't even start the conversation. This is a practical thing. 
All right. Uh, the next question kind of builds on some of the things you said, because um, I, I used to work in a tower company that had a lot of Arthur Anderson consultants come in right about the time all that went down. <laughs> um, and I also have done uh, trainings for the local McDonald's franchise where a lot of the work that's done is in fact mechanistic. But my experience with the local leadership is that they very much care about the individuals and I have friends that work in the stores and to them it's a family even though it's very mechanistic so mm -hmm. I think is there a way even if the work that needs to be done is mechanistic can we still bring in these higher motivations as managers because I've seen it happen in yeah. the, cu the customers I work with yeah I yes I think so in fact answering to your question if you go to the model of this professor I was saying before, Amy, uh, I don't even know how to pronounce the second name, Richard, whatever. Uh, she's at Yale and she's working on this area. And uh, people using the work that she's doing, they are saying, you know what, just think that your work is mechanistic. Okay, it's just a job. Then the weekend you will have fun and you will do something good for others, even go to the church. So just distinguish from your job and your, you know, the other things that also are part of your motivation. I think that's wrong. I, I totally agree with you. We need to think about, even if the work is so mechanistic and the company itself is really mechanistic because you're doing something very manual, practical, you can always go and move to the highest level. How do you do that? Basically, by is this a personal reflection? It's always a personal reflection, which means you need to have conversations and reflection with your people. That's why philosophy and humanism is so important for managers. It's not just about, you know, pushing buttons or making decisions that are super financial, technical. It's much more than that. It's understanding your people. So, like the example you were giving, I have a lot of examples in that sense of people that basically, because of the conversation with the managers, basically the managers were telling them about the purpose of the company and the purpose of the work they were adding and the value they were adding to the company to the final value they were adding to the organization and the society. If you keep talking about that in your company, then even if my work is super, super specific and manual, I would say I belong to this institution and I am giving this to this village, which is very practical, but you know what? We need it. I'm useful to the society and I, I'm adding value to the institutions and the society. But also, if you have a, a personal faith, your father God is always there. So you need anyone to tell you that what you're doing is right, not even a boss. I mean, once you put all these dimensions in your work, you don't need anyone. You, maybe you need a, 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 a boss, a manager, that allows you to be free in here and in here. It's more about respecting other people and understanding of the fourth level, which is very fragile, but also, Transmitting the idea of a calling. You're called to do this because it's practical. And that usefulness is good for all of us. Sorry, I probably was No, that, that's fine. I do have a question of that outer level. Okay. Now, I come from the non-religious community and, you know, part of that. And we get people all the time who are being discriminated by their managers because their managers are in, in, introducing religion into a workplace where it's not relevant to the work at all. Right. And that's not <clears throat> to them, right? That's someone oppressing them with religion, and it's weird to talk about religion in that way, but that's how it's experienced by people when it's pushed on them. So, you know, and I would label this, because I'm an atheist, right? I would label this outer one, I still have it, but mm -hmm. the labels are slightly different about what's going on, right? Um, yeah. So what is the appropriate limit to what, companies can do before they start causing problems in their effort to promote motivation? Well, I love that question because uh, I've been receiving that question all the time. Last time was basically uh, at the Kennedy School in, in Harvard. I got the same question and I have to say that it's really relevant because we want to keep talking about motivations, spiritual and religious. But some people say, we keep talking about this, we will start fighting. Better not to include this. I don't think it's true. There are millions of human beings with religious motivation, and we need to understand 
those people and people that have a spiritual motivation, like those on top of it. But the one here, spiritual gift, holiness or self giving, it doesn't require that you believe in the of God. You believe in the spirituality of life and the holiness of the person being spiritual and all that stuff. Of course, for a religious person, that means heaven and God. But, I mean, you here have the entire map, so people may understand their own motivations. But then going to your question, as managers, companies are not there for the purpose of promoting religion or spirituality. Their purpose is basically to promote a good that is material, and this is the work in which they have to respect this. If this is a church, it's different. But if it's an organization that is business, then this is a lay approach, lay people. And what I mean with this is that they have to respect everyone in this area, but never trying to make this part of the company itself. Because it's not business. This is not, this is not a business. This all belongs to faith. This. And is faith in God existing or faith in God not existing? It's faith. And we all need to be free to say yes or no in that area and feel free every time we make a decision on that. Because it's a very important decision every human being has to make. And no one has seen God. And this is about so, faith. So what I'm understanding is that the realm of a manager should restrict itself to the, 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 th the three by three grid. Uh, I, I guess the, the manager needs to understand them all. And then he needs to understand that in the first level, he has a lot of opportunity to basically to be affecting that because it's material and it's expensive. He's the one basically managing that one. The second level, he has less impact or influence, but he still can do a lot by developing the appropriate culture and environment. And also incentives and putting people here or there, right? Mm -hmm. The third one is also in that same sense, but here you have even less capacity to influence. Because the influence of the upper part has a lot to do with respecting people by giving an example of respect and letting them grow. And, and making sure that everyone is trying to grow in the company and promoting uh, habits of behavior that promote optimism, uh, good work, all this stuff that is human virtues are making you a better person flourishing in the world. But the, the, the other column, you just can't promote it by giving an example and suggesting, but never using mechanistic approaches on pushing. And the fourth one, you don't even talk about that during the work, or you talk, it's okay, but it's just respect because this is fragile. And fragile means everyone needs to feel that they are okay with whatever they believe, because this is not about what they believe. This is about flourishing in the workplace. So for example, right now, if I'm offering my work to God, this is just personal with me and him. So no one cares about that, and it's fine, and I'm doing the same work. No one says that. It's personal, it's internal, but, but also respect means that sometimes some people, because for religious purposes, need to take a day free, a different day from someone else. You need to understand them, and to understand them, you need to understand that these are human motivations, and they require respect. But don't push anyone. Don't press anyone to go anywhere in your company, because then you're destroying trust, and also destroying the opportunity for people to flourish. It's like in a garden, like pulling up from a flower. Why do you want to pull up from a flower? Let people flourish by themselves and find what they want to do in their lives by themselves. Don't push. Right, the difference between you know, forcing growth and allowing flourishing is, right. is the freedom. The, one of the things that you're talking about with the moral good and the transitive motives, that, that outer band, not the outer outer band, but the middle band, um, mm. you had something up there on creating humane work environments. Right. And, and that's what we're talking about, right? That's the role of, if we create a humane environment, we're allowing the moral good and the transitive motives to, take root. Right. Okay. So uh, the humane, by the way, what I understand by humane or not humane workplace would be a place in which when you go to work every single day, you flourish. And that means you are developing moral virtues because you want. And you develop moral virtues by practicing a habit. Like imagine you are up, you're pessimistic by nature. You are, your temperament is pessimistic. You are melancholic. But you're surrounded by people who are optimistic. And the environment of your office, your organization, your institution is really optimistic. This is a really healthy organization. 
ethically healthy organization, humane or humanistic approach, is when you go to work and you become a better human being, more optimistic, more like working better, harder, with more order. It's all about human virtues. And we know about virtues since the Greek philosophy, and we have a lot to learn from there, and Stoics and all that stuff. So this is, but the opposite is when you are trying to push bottles where you shouldn't, and then what are you doing? Basically, destroying human flourishing in the organization, which means, and I keep telling this example, I'm sorry about this, but, and it's not just my institution, I think at the universities, because of the incentive system that we have. When you arrive to the university, you are an idealist, really generous, and want to do a lot of good to society and to your students, but the system is telling you, don't tell them that because you need to publish first. I had a, you have the fear of not saying things because you didn't publish and someone will copy and then publish and then you're not getting your position. It's all competition and not telling the truth and not being generous. This is how an institution by using the incentive system wrong is destroying humanity and not being a humane. So everyone, every manager should think that the way we are using the power is affecting to the way people behave because of this, because we learn. If you're telling me that if I don't publish enough, I will keep teaching more hours, which is what happened in Spain, it means like teaching is like penalty. It's like, you know, it's not a reward. And I love teaching. So you have to decide to stop doing research to keep teaching. It's kind of crazy, but you're promoting behaviors in the way you basically facilitate that. And this is the way you make companies not being humane at all. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. When I, you know, talk to companies about workplace, counterproductive workplace behaviors that occur, because I come from a behavioral perspective, this issue of what are you incentivizing? And if you're getting the wrong result, you're incentivizing the exact wrong thing. And it's usually you have to flip it. Elizabeth, do you want to, do you have any questions do you want to ask or should we open it up to the discussion room? Uh -huh. Yeah, I actually will ask a couple questions that have been submitted via the chat. Um, the first one is from Gabriel, and he asks, um, is the question of whether work as a calling is an elitist idea, is that itself an elitist idea? Uh, I, I think that this framework is not an elitist idea in itself, it's idealistic. Uh, these are ideals. This is the ideal human flourishing and human happiness. In fact, when I went to Aristotle, basically what we have here is an understanding of human beings that are capable of deciding freely what kind of people they want to be. And this is what I mean by flourishing. We come to this world and we can freely decide the kind of person we want to be. So I don't see this as a less elitist or, no, I see this as universal. We all have the capacity to decide the kind of person we want to be through our actions. And we spend eight hours a day in our work. So if we cannot be generous in, in our house or in our church, and then not to be that generous in our work. This is schizophrenic. We're the same people. So I see this more like a universal calling to happiness in the workplace. We're all called to be happy, not just a few guys or elitist kind of approach. And the same thing with the giving thing. Maybe sometimes we think about this as an analytics thing because of the giving. Well, because you have, you can give. Well, you know, the giving thing is about your, uh, your interest for others' good. It's not about how much you have or you, the nature of your work. I know a lot of people, and I come from a really low level family, that we learn in my family that by giving you, you will become very happy. And it is precisely what Maslow is talking about in his book, and he's devoting an entire chapter to the transgenders and gives 24 definition of what is a transcendent. And it's not elitist. It's, he found that there are transcendents among business people more than uh, among nurses or doctors. So this is universal and it's a calling for everyone. Uh, the thing is that with virtual of meeting in business schools uh, is that it's just the opposite. It's that you want to be getting as much money as you can in your career. And I say, no, 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 it's not about that. It's about much more than that. And so what I understand you is that because it allows freedom as, as one of the main driving principles, people can pick where they want to be on the spectrum. So in that sense, maybe it's not elitist. Gabriel, I have unmuted you. So did that answer your question? Would you like yeah. to weigh in on anything? 
yeah, yeah, no, let me let me uh, see if I can rephrase it, Manuel, because because uh, uh, I agree with what you said. Uh, I appreciate it, and what you said sounds like a response to the question: Is this an elitist idea? Uh, and and what I've what I've heard in my working with people is that that question itself, in my experience, tends to only come from people who are the most privileged an elitist. And so I'm wondering, is the question itself an elitist idea? I think so. I agree with you. And in fact, we can go back to Aristotle, because that was the same thing was happening there. And it was true. It was the philosopher, it was an elitist, because he was the only one that could make these kind of questions, because he had free time. It's like neck ocean. Negocio, neck ocean is not ocean time, which is free time for that. But it comes from the people who can make that question. But the rest of the world, not, not asking from that point of view, would say, for me, this is common sense. My grandma would say, hey, Manolo, <laughs> this is exactly what I'm trying to do in my job, which is just normal job, ordinary kind of work. But I try to do my best for you, my grandchildren, and for society. She was in a big, she was running a bakery. And I, I felt that she was in the fourth dimension, uh, coming from a poor family, and still doing that. So I think you're right. The elitist question comes from an elitist approach, which is career development approach to management and motivation. So we need to, to just switch on the light and say, okay, it's much more than that. Human beings are not thinking only about that. Um, okay, so the, the, can we the, stop sharing the screen for, and so we get faces now because we're doing conversation? So, sure. thanks. Okay. Great. Um, the next question we've got is from uh, Marilyn. Uh, she wants to know if it's a private business, when might the motive of religion in the workplace be okay for the manager to bring into work? That's a very good question. What I'm trying to do with the framework is not telling people to bring the, the ideas to the work, but to let that happen in the, work, in the workplace. And this is very important. What I mean, that's why I keep saying first, Managers should read this and understand this framework because then they will be able to understand their employees. But as managers, their work is not to make decisions on anything regarding religion and spirituality. As managers, they have to manage resources. Um, this is all about the first level. Um, maybe a little bit of the second one, but not that much. And that's all. But they need to understand the third and the fourth. And to understand that means understanding that some people may be really good in their work because they say that they're getting to heaven through that work. And that once they understand that, they will be very happy of having someone like that person there because they don't need to pay more or to convince that person. That person is convinced on their crisis and their problem. And their, so in fact, letting people to flourish from all the points, possible points of view will be good for the entire organization, but not bringing the topic explicitly. I don't think that's appropriate. And of course, this is always all culture. There are countries, places, villages, in which it would be natural to bring this, places in which it will never be natural. But I guess that the universal thing would be, let this happen. Don't bring the topic to the conversation, especially if someone is not just done with it. My, my understanding of what you're saying is that this is, how, this is what motivates humans in its right. entirety, but managers are focused you know, it's inappropriate for managers to be there, but they can create the conditions for the individual to do whatever they want with that. Right, okay. right. The, the upper levels are always personal. And what we do is, once we move to the moral and spiritual, you, you need to respect all these people's beliefs and freedom to decide the kind of life they want to live. So yes, just let them do whatever, but you are helping them to flourish because you're creating the atmosphere for them to do that or not. And most companies are basically uh, just opposed to that in the sense that they do not allow people to do that because of the pressure they put, the time, the time work kind of, the timetable of the world, all this stuff, the, the relationship with the families. There are a lot of issues there in which they are basically opposing to the openness of those dimensions by making decisions in one aspect level. 
Um, so we have another um, building on that, uh, PJ and Dara uh, want to say just a suggestion, um, since the term religious can be problematic, um, perhaps using a word like transcendent to describe these motives. And I think that builds into the concept of spiritual capital, which is not necessarily a relationship with a higher power, but something that is more meaningful. It could be ancestors, it could be nature. Um, you want to comment on that? Yeah. In fact, in fact I, I had that issue when I published the paper. By the way, you will all have access to the paper in which I am describing very specifically each one of the elements. I had that issue, and I totally agree. In fact, some authors talk about extrinsic, intrinsic, and transcendent motivation. Um, so I decided not to use the transcendent, and instead I used the transitive, transitive because it's not connected with the transcendental and then it's not making confusion. And I did explicit the religious one because everyone understands religious as something organized and believing in God. So in putting in that way, all the people who are just as you're describing, thinking in the sense of a higher purpose, higher meaning, and those are all in the upper level, spiritual. They are all represented there. And this in every, in every continent. I've been teaching this in every place, and they all see themselves there, so yeah. Okay. Great. So I decided not to use transcendent. Okay. Um, now, uh, David would like to know, um, how might we reconcile this framework with organizations that engage in behaviors or produce products that would seemingly be at odds with many of these values? Um, while not wanting to pick on any one industry, mm -hmm. the defense industry comes to mind as an example. <laughs> I love that question. Uh, that's, that's a very important question, and the answer is it's already part of the question because the thing is that you cannot use this framework at all. I mean, what you can see from here, and I love to see this in this way, is that you, can, you may have three basic models in business, mechanistic, organicistic, and humanistic. Those are the three levels there. Mechanistic is the first level, organicistic the second, and humanistic including the, the two other levels. If the company has a model, and what I mean a model, the product or the service they're producing is inhuman, or not serving to the humanity properly, then you can only use the mechanical approach. Don't even, they don't even try to move to the other. Or if, if they use the other, by the way, the upper level, normally will be to abuse people, confidence, and, and to like, manipulate people. So you can only work in the third level if you really practice that in the way you serve, in your problem, in your commitment with society, in your sector. So there are business, businesses that are incompatible with this framework. And I was talking about companies like Arthur Anderson, where I was describing that example before. So that's a very important question. Um, okay, so David, I have um, unmuted you. So did that answer your question? Would you like to weigh in on that? Yeah, no, I, I think, you know, just as, as we try to think about these things, um, you know, what also came to mind is the idea of, of recruiting um, in terms of, as we think about how we prepare students and how we, you know, in terms of what we're teaching and then and then we have, these companies and other companies, chemical or whatever we, you know, that, that aren't going to reach that top round, how, how do we guide them and, and how do we kind of resolve that issue when those are, when they're coming, you know, to campus and those kinds of things. So that, those, that's, it's, obviously it's a more complex question than. <laughs> no, but I love, I love the question, David, and that brings to my mind that I'm doing an exercise with my students, basically giving them this framework and asking them to think about their job in five years from now, and once they just, I, I, don't, I don't only have mentoring session if they want, because this is very personal, but what I ask them is, okay, now that you have your motivation clear, now that you have your motivations clear in that framework, you may understand your job. Some people are so idealistic that they don't even see students, their job as a job, and I need to push them, okay, you need a salary, you need money, come on, you don't change the world by just working, you need money. So I, this helps them to understand all the levels, but also then I ask them, okay, search for a company in which the mission of the company in which you want to work is fitting with your mission in your purpose. If not, don't even try. Because the selection process may work, but it will not work in the future for you. So I think this is helping a lot for the selection process from the part of the company, understanding which is your mission and the way you understand the motivation of your employees and the other way around. So it, this is helping me a lot to help to my students to be realistic, but at the same time idealistic. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, 
I want to kind of jump in on this topic as well, because I've, I've worked with people from Arthur Anderson in the middle of what happened. And wow. I have, I know people who were in military intelligence. I know the person who found Osama bin Laden, not Osama bin Laden, um, uh, the guy from Iraq, <laughs> Saddam Hussein. Um, and the people, and I know people in law enforcement and they're all humanists and they're all dedicated human humanistic, caring, compassionate, responsible, realistic people who think they're doing good work. Even the people at Arthur Anderson leading up to what happened thought they were doing good work. So how do we help yeah. people in, yeah. in necessary jobs that also have a tendency towards inhumanity because of the nature of the work, help them influence the culture of their companies so that the inhumanity doesn't happen. Yeah, well, I have to say first, regarding Arthur Anderson, I, I recorded a video about leadership and I mentioned this and a friend of mine told me, you know, I know people from Harvard, I know people that were working there and they're great guys. I don't think you should be mentioning this company because this is just the decision of a few guys doing the wrong thing. And I agree with him. So basically that video is not anymore in internet. So I'm glad that you're saying this. I'm not talking about every employee in that company. I'm talking about a specific people doing the wrong thing. And the business is not wrong by itself, that business. It was the wrong doing of a business. So I would say that if you know that you're in a business in which your company is doing wrong, then I normally recommend to my students and people when I give advice to try to change, as you're saying that, to change the, the cultural environment, but also to think about other scenarios, other possibilities, like leaving the company. If you cannot change that, and it's transforming you for the worse, then just leave, just go. Because this is understanding your work as the way you save yourself as a human being. So if the company, again, I'm not talking about necessarily companies that are doing the wrong thing, could be good companies, but the environment of your team or your office or whatever, it's not good, it's destroying you because they are gossiping all the time, because they're very negative, because whatever. If you see this is not helping you, you need to help them to improve and change that in a positive way or not. If you cannot, then I would recommend this move to another place because this is a free market. <laughs> Um, so we don't have any more questions right now. Um, one thing I might uh, think is uh, I'm very interested in metrics. So how do you link metrics to these kind of this framework? Well, I didn't talk much about my research because you told me this is for practitioners and it's not focused, not being a like, typical academic focus on research, but I'm doing a lot of research right, right now. One of the things we're doing in my institute, we build, we're building scale to measure this. Uh, we need to validate that scale statistically. I guess we will finish in six months, something like that. And once we have that, I want to share that with everyone. So we all can use that as a way of, of basically analyzing. This is a diagnosis of your culture, of your company, of your organization. So we're working on that metric. And um, right now, it's, I, say, I think it's working quite well. We have a lot of focus group with experts. And so I, this will be a matter of time we get there. That's the metric for that. By the way, with that kind of metric, you can prove a lot of things. Like for example, institution with a more materialistic approach or more humanistic approach, you will see the results. And by the way, I'm not trying to prove that the results of a higher level of humanistic management approach is necessarily giving more money. That for some people, sometimes it is, but I guess it would be giving the same, in the long term, it will be more, but that's not the point. What I want to prove, and this is what I'm also building in terms of metrics, that in companies in which they really care about higher level of motivations, then the result is higher level of flourishing, and you can measure that. Higher level of dignity environment, and you can measure that. Higher levels of good work, high quality kind of work, and you can measure all that. Of course, you can also measure level of trust. If it's just calculated trust, is emotional trust, or also moral trust, and of course, you can measure commitment and engagement. You can measure all that. So I, I want to prove once I have the scale, having I'm, I'm only already committed in several research. So I'm sending this because there are researchers there. I'm open to the research also all around the world, comparing different places and cultural institutions. But I think this is really important. 
to do this and to prove that it's not about making more money. It's about building places in which people, they will say, I want to stay here because you know what? They respect me. They help me to build a family. They help me to be the person I am and I'm happy. So I don't want to change my job. <laughs> so this is retention of talent. All this idea of talent retention is not about mechanistic approach. It's not how much money you pay or it's not about how much fun you have. It's much, much more about how much you promote this flourishing and people giving themselves to others and respecting other people's beliefs and then people will go there and want to stay there forever. Okay, um, thank you. Um, so real, real quick, we've got 10 minutes left. Um, if you're interested in getting a certificate of completion for participating in this, uh, please make sure you put it in the chat room. We need your full name, first and last name, your email, and what sort of certificate you want. My company, Humanist Learning Systems, offers an HRCI, a SHRM, and a general certificate. So name, email, and uh, type of certificates, and you can ask for more than one, that's fine. Elizabeth? Okay, um, so I want to get to Dara's question, and I'm going to unmute you, Dara. Um, she says, um, internal activism, like we see at Google, can create change in terms of aligning behaviors to mission. Um, so do you want to speak to how some an employee with this humanistic uh, framework could maybe affect change with, you know, through their informal authority within an organization? Yeah. We have, yeah. I was just going to um, expand on the expand on the comment or the question if you think it's necessary. If not, I'll mute. Oh, um, I was just going to say that um, we see that a lot in, in the Bay Area and that, you know, for instance, with Google, they were able to actually with a critical mass of employees who, who saw a certain project for the government, um, I think it was for around drones, um, building drones that would be able to better bomb people. Um, they said that that's not aligned to our mission and were with a critical mass of people, you know, they submitted letters, but ultimately with the force of that, we're able to shut it down. And they're doing something similar with work, um, with work in China that Google has on the slate because they believe it's not, Google's mission is around democracy and, and um, it doesn't align. So they're, you know, they're doing, you know, not just signing letters, but actual physical protests. Yeah, I totally agree. And I love that example. This is yeah, this is it. Companies need to have a clear mission uh, and use that mission to say, well, this is not for our mission, so we're not promoting this and stopping this or changing this uh, kind of service we're giving, all that stuff. This is part of real moral corporate social responsibility, which is also something I always insist. We talk, we keep talking about corporate social responsibility, but we forget about the word moral. Uh, and there are a lot of corporate social responsibility policies that are immoral. I think you are describing a moral one because it's basically a focus on the contribution to common good and stopping behaviors or, or things that can promote wrong behaviors. So I think this is a great example of what we're talking about. Thank you. Thank you. And, and the answer to the question in the chat is yes, you need to put it in the chat room whether you need a certificate of completion and we need all that information in the chat room. So, okay, great. Um, and we have one question from uh, Gabriel again. Um, he says, you briefly mentioned that in order to explore the mission level of motivation, people must be comfortable with what they believe. Working with a client, as we open this conversation up, we had some people leave the company because they were not comfortable with the conversation. What ideas might you have to invite people into this conversation in the most healthy way possible? such that you invite people um, rather than losing them along the way. Yeah, I, I think that the key there is understanding what is the conversation. The conversation means talking, but also listening. So when you listen to someone, means you need to know before that person joins the conversation, if that person wants to join the conversation, or if the topic of the conversation is something that that person wants to talk about. So, I, I, that's why I think this is the kind of topic that is so fragile that before you start a conversation that is a group conversation that you promote in your company, you need to first ask each one personally, personally, will you be okay with having this kind of topic? And if they are not okay, you shouldn't start a conversation. That's respect. That's understanding the fragility of this. And for some people, only because you ask that question, they will bring you a reason that is reasonable. Or sometimes they will give you a reason that gives you also an opportunity to start a conversation. And later that person will be part of the conversation. 
But what you cannot do is to start conversations of topics in which people don't want to talk about, or are not ready to talk about, or they don't want to. So I, I think conversation is about that. It's listening, understanding, respecting. And I, I agree with the example, and I think we need to be very, I don't know which, I think fragile is the way to express the content, but you need to be very, I don't know, not even honest, but more than that, really caring about people. Uh, Dave, um, can I can I ask a follow up on that? Um, in the in in performance evaluations, we had a question that was submitted, um, you know, in the registration about can we integrate these conversations into our performance evaluations, and is that a good way to start helping um, have this conversation with employees in the workplace to make sure that they're motivational needs as an individual are being taken care of as part of the obligation of the company to the employee. So, so what's the question then? Oh, you're muted. I'm muted. How do we integrate this into a performance <coughs> valuation or should we? Should it be part of the evaluation? No, 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 I don't think so. No. I, again, I think this is part of conversation, not about evaluation is a systemic way of, uh, of, making sure that the person is fitting with the company and it's a technical process that is important is technical. Then this is part of the cultural organization and having conversation that can be taken or not into the place. Yeah, I wouldn't include that at all. I don't know if I answer. Sometimes I'm very like direct. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, and Jessica has a comment and um, she says, I really appreciated the table of how to look at the ways of allowing motivation, not necessarily directly motivating in the workplace. Um, this will be so helpful in talking with my clients about how to promote humanistic management techniques in their organization. All right. Yeah, I think freedom is key because when you move to morality and and ethics is about freedom and understanding of the people's freedom and respecting that freedom. Then you can talk because you're not pushing, you're just talking. And then we all, we all want to be happy. This is the good news. That's why I'm so optimistic about this framework. We all want to be happy. So, um, and if we see that the manager is using this framework as a manipulation kind of technique, we will see that coming and then we're not having that conversation. And then we're not moving to the third level. So uh, that's why I'm very, I mean, confident with the framework to be well used or that is not working. Um, we have only a couple minutes left. Again, if you need a certificate of completion, please tell us who you are and what certificates you want in your email so we can get those to you in the chat room. Um, just a reminder that uh, we are the International Humanistic Management Association. We have quite a number of online uh, Formats like this, we have a PhD network, we have a necessary conversation, we have the humanistic management professionals. I think there's an intellectual shaman conversation we do as well. To be told about all of those things, please go to our website, humanisticmanagement.international and sign up for our mailing list. And to let everybody know, our next one is not gonna be in December. Our next one is gonna be at the end of January, on January 25th. We have Doug Kirkpatrick from um, Redshift they talk about he's an expert in flat management matrix management so if you've heard about that and you're interested in that he's lived it <laughs> and actually so have i so it's going to be an interesting conversation about how exactly you manage without managing so that's going to be our january 25th but again to be notified of that you need to join our mailing list at humanisticmanagement.international so elizabeth do you have anything else you want to add uh, no, just be sure to type in your name and email and what certificate you want. If you want a certificate, I'll be saving the chat in one minute. Great. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, I, we appreciate your time, Manuel. It was fabulous. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. I am about to turn off recording. <laughs>